Should we follow the FDA and give SSRIs for PTSD or venture off-label with the fabled prazosin? Experts are divided, and today we'll look at both sides of the argument. Welcome to the Carlat Psychiatry Podcast, keeping psychiatry honest since 2003. I'm Chris Aiken, the Editor-in-Chief of the Carlat Psychiatry Report. And I'm Kelly Newsom, a psychiatric NP and a dedicated reader of every issue. We're going to end our series on PTSD with a focus on medications. We save that for last, not because it's the best, but because meds are generally not as effective as therapy is here. I'd start with that message for patients, as we already live in a culture that prioritizes meds over pretty much all else in mental health. But if your patient still prefers medication, or they haven't had success with therapy, go ahead and try medication. People tend to respond best to the treatment they prefer. For first-line treatments, we usually go with the FDA, but we have some reasons to second-guess the FDA's picks in PTSD. There are two FDA-approved options, sertraline and paroxetine, but these SSRIs have problems. Sertraline only worked in two out of seven trials, and some analysis find it only effective in women with civilian trauma. For paroxetine, the data is more robust, but the side effects are worse. This one has some of the highest rates of withdrawal problems, fatigue, sexual side effects, and anticholinergic effects, and it has the worst pregnancy safety of any SSRI. If you do start with an SSRI, I prefer fluoxetine, Prozac, in PTSD. Fluoxetine might be off-label, but it does have more studies in PTSD than the FDA-approved paroxetine and a larger effect size in PTSD than sertraline. That's based on two meta-analyses. Fluoxetine also has a few tolerability advantages— Compared to other SSRIs, it has a lower risk of withdrawal problems and weight gain. The dose is 20 to 40 milligrams a day in PTSD. For paroxetine, the PTSD dose is similar, 20 to 50 milligrams a day, while sertraline had a wider range in PTSD of 50 to 200 milligrams a day. Another serotonergic option for PTSD is venlafaxine, 75 to 225 milligrams per day. This SNRI is about as effective as fluoxetine and paroxetine, but we're a bit less likely to start with it because like paroxetine, it has a high risk of withdrawal symptoms. Some patients respond really well to SSRIs, particularly women and those with civilian trauma, but if the response isn't meaningful or the side effects are too meaningful, We've got a lot of options up ahead in this episode. But before we lose our CME eligibility going off-label in this podcast, let's pause for a preview of the CME test. One, which medications are FDA-approved in PTSD? A, sertraline and fluoxetine. B. Venlafaxine and fluoxetine. C. Paroxetine and venlafaxine. D. Sertraline and paroxetine. PTSD is one area of psychiatry where I tend to deviate from the FDA. Not only do I prefer fluoxetine over sertraline and paroxetine, but I often use prazosin first line here. Why? Because prazosin doesn't just treat nightmares. It helps daytime symptoms of PTSD as well. And it worked in military as well as civilian trauma. Prazosin studies may not be as large as those for the SSRIs, which means that we're not as certain about what we say about prazosin as we are with the SSRIs. But while our knowledge of SSRIs may be more certain, it's not very encouraging. Their effect size is small, 0.3. Some, like sertraline, didn't consistently work. And they cause problems that I don't like to see, particularly in PTSD. Problems like sleep disruption, apathy. You know, apathy is a symptom of PTSD. And sexual dysfunction, 
Think about that for people who are trying to rebuild their romantic life after a sexual trauma. These are subtle, long-term problems that don't tend to raise alarms in acute trials, and that gives number crunchers the impression that these SSRI medications are better tolerated than they really are. Prezacin has been around since 1988, so we are pretty certain about its safety and tolerability. The main risk is low blood pressure. This is serious enough that it earned the drug a black box warning about syncope and falls, even when treating high blood pressure. In that population, the FDA estimates about 1% of people have syncope and the rate is particularly high after the first dose. So you'd want to start low and use fall precautions while starting it. In the PTSD trials, falls were not more common than placebo, but there was a risk of orthostatic blood pressure changes with prazosin. We'd estimate this is about 4% risk based on the largest trial. Prazosin's psychiatric benefits were discovered in the late 1990s by Murray Raskind, who was working at the University of Washington VA Center, when he noticed a striking pattern. A few patients in his group therapy had dramatic improvements in their PTSD nightmares after starting Prazosin for benign prostatic hypertrophy. Prazosin treats that by relaxing smooth muscle and improving urine flow. From those early observations, Raskin went on to confirm Prazosin's benefits, not just for nightmares, but for daytime symptoms of PTSD as well, in multiple randomized controlled trials that were replicated by independent groups. This may seem like a serendipitous discovery, the kind that any of us could have made by paying close attention to our patients. But as Louis Pasteur put it, chance favors the prepared mind. And Raskin's mind was prepared. He had studied Prazosin's effects on the hypothalamus in basic science research before this discovery, and probably had a keener eye than most of us would when his patients started taking this adrenergic antagonist. As the positive trials rolled in, nearly two dozen in all, there was a problem. Most were small, involving fewer than 100 patients each. So Dr. Raskin launched a more definitive trial. This one would enroll 304 patients across 13 VA hospitals. Prazosin was titrated over five weeks to an average daily dose of around 15 milligrams per day, so a respectable dose, and they kept it going for a respectable time as well, six months in all. But at the end of the trial, there was no significant difference on the medication, not for sleep or nightmares, not for daytime symptoms, and not even for secondary measures. There was less suicidality in the Prazosin group, an encouraging finding given that another adrenergic antagonist, Trazodone, was associated with an increased risk of suicidality in the veteran population. That study came out in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and for many, it signaled the death knell for Prazosin. Others rushed in to explain the results. Like military trauma, the population doesn't tend to respond as well to treatment. But, you know, Prazosin has worked in lots of studies of military trauma, something we can't say for the SSRIs, which largely failed there. Other explanations, like there was a high placebo response rate, and the study criteria biased the sample toward milder cases of PTSD, who might be more likely to get better with the placebo. They also required that patients come off trazodone in order to start the trial. Now, that's a big deal because trazodone is widely used in the VA, and it has a common mechanism with prazosin, blocking adrenergic receptors. So this may have biased the sample toward patients who didn't respond well to that mechanism of action. But it's not enough to make excuses. To prove that prazosin works, we need a large trial showing that it does, and we don't have that for you. In place of that, We have meta-analyses that were published after the negative trial, so they include those results. And even though that large trial casts a heavy shadow over the results, those analyses still turn up positive for prazosin, with a large effect size for nightmares, a medium to large benefit for sleep, and a small benefit, similar to that of the SSRIs, for daytime symptoms of PTSD. Narrowing in on those daytime benefits, Prazosin helps in order from greatest benefit to least, 
anhedonia, difficulty concentrating, and hypervigilance. It's possible that those benefits are all a result of sleeping better, but if they are, then hey, Prazosin is addressing one of the underlying problems. You'll hear some experts who discourage Prazosin and others who recommend it first line. The difference hinges on that large trial and on how much weight that expert puts on scientific certainty. For me, we may not be as certain about what Prazosin does as we are with the SSRIs, but what we do know points to a more meaningful benefit for patients with a lot less problems. This is where a collaborative approach is really key. I mean, many patients might prefer an SSRI, but others might prefer a highly effective and tolerable treatment where we're only 70% certain of it, then a minimally effective treatment with a 90% certainty, the SSRIs, particularly when that highly certain treatment comes with risks of weight gain, apathy, sexual side effects, withdrawal problems, bone thinning, and like Prazosin, the SSRIs are also associated with falls. That's our bias, and we're not alone in it. The Psychopharmacology Algorithm Project, led by David Ossa, arrived at a similar conclusion. They recommend starting with prazosin if the patient has nightmares or hyperarousal at night, which the vast majority of patients do. After that, Ossa recommends SSRIs. And here, his concerns about sertraline's limited efficacy and paroxetine's tolerability also lead him off-label. However, he cautions about jumping into metazapine. It's tempting to think metazapine must work in PTSD, as it is one of the best antidepressants for anxious depression and insomnia. But the studies for anxiety or even insomnia and PTSD are limited, mixed, and don't come close to the level of certainty that even we with these lax biases would demand. But wait a minute. Some of you may have heard that mirtazapine is a good choice for sleep apnea. And sleep apnea is a common problem in PTSD affecting some 40 to 80% of patients. If you were thinking that, major bonus points for knowing that. Mirtazapine does relax pharyngeal muscles and was touted as a treatment for sleep apnea some 10 or 20 years ago. But as with many ideas that passed the intuitive test, it was debunked by controlled trials. Now, current studies are looking instead to clonidine, trazodone, and a surprising one, atomoxetine, as leading pharmacologic candidates to open the airways at night. What's going on here is that drug companies are repurposing those medications because a lot of patients don't use or can't tolerate devices, the first-line treatment for sleep apnea, and they're exploring pharmacologic options. Of those, clonidine and trazodone might have a combined benefit for sleep and nightmares in PTSD as well as sleep apnea. But this little aside reminds me of an important warning. A recent study from 2019 found that patients with hypertension who use alpha-1 antagonists like our favorite prazosin have a higher risk of sleep apnea. Now, take that with a grain of salt. That study was not controlled, so we'll hold on any serious warnings, but we will anxiously await more data on this complex and counterintuitive area of choosing a med that matches best for PTSD and sleep apnea. Prazosin may prevent PTSD. It did so in a small trial of acute stress disorder, but that study was too small to put much weight on it. It may also help migraines associated with PTSD. That's also from a small trial, published last year by Raskind's group. When nightmares don't improve with prazosin, Other options with smaller studies include clonidine and prazosin's cousin, doxazosin. Here's how to use prazosin. Start at 1 mg QHS and raise by 1 to 2 mg every 4 to 7 days, based on response and tolerability. Once you reach a daily dose of 3 to 5 mg, you can start giving some of the dose, around 25% of it, in the morning. The target dose is much higher than most clinicians reach. Average doses were 12 to 16 milligrams in most trials, and the maximum dose is different for women and men, likely because of different cardiovascular responses. Those are a maximum of 25 milligrams per day for men and 12 milligrams per day for women. Check blood pressure and pulse and monitor for falls during titration. 
If a patient is taking other antihypertensive, consult with a provider managing those and consider tapering them off after titrating prazosin. And be extra careful about falls on those first couple doses. Now, if your patient has alcohol problems, prazosin is less likely to work. But here's a tip. Prazosin does reduce alcohol use when combined with cyproheptadine, 8 to 12 milligrams at night. The combination significantly reduced alcohol use in a recent controlled trial, and it's likely they have a synergistic effect because neither of them reduce alcohol use when used on their own. One caveat, the trial did not involve PTSD. Another option for PTSD with alcohol use disorder is topiramate, and we're going to get more into that and other off-label options in next week's episode. But first, some points of clarification on this episode. We mentioned that there's a 1% risk of syncope with prazosin. That 1% is when starting at a 2 milligram dose. And the PDR recommends starting lower, which is why Kelly listed a starting dose of 1 milligrams. Also, Dr. Oster's guidelines for PTSD don't exactly recommend antidepressants second line. We didn't mean to imply that. They recommend starting with prazosin when the patient is having nightmares or nocturnal hyperarousal, which is most patients with PTSD. They recommend starting with an SSRI if those are not pressing problems. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge an error in our August 5th podcast on research updates. There I mentioned that ilopiridone phenapt, which was recently approved in bipolar mania, might have a big effect in that disorder because of its small p-value. I was wrong there. P-values are a marker for certainty, not for efficacy, something we touched on in this episode. P-values tell us how certain we are that a drug works better than placebo. You can get a small p-value by having a big effect. That's true, as big effects are easy to detect in a trial. But you can also get a small p-value by having a small effect, such as when a study has a very large population or the results have a very narrow statistical spread or standard deviation. That's when we're very certain about the results, even though we're certain that there's a small effect. So to correct for that error, I've calculated the effect size for ilopiridone and mania from their phase 3 trial of 414 patients, and indeed, It is small, 0.22. So while we're certain that ilopiridone works in mania, we are also certain that it doesn't work very much. Want to keep up with the latest in psychiatric research? We post new studies in the Daily Psych feed. Search for Chris Aiken MD on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and that new one, Threads. It's a first glimpse of the trials that inform this podcast. Thanks for tuning in and helping us stay free of industry support. Thanks for watching. Hit subscribe if you enjoyed this content. And to earn CMEs for listening, head on over to thecarlatreport.com slash podcast.